The Cold War is often seen as lasting from 1947, when the Truman Doctrine was declared to protect free peoples against oppression, until 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed. It pitted the United States and its NATO allies against the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact members. After World War II carrier aviation looked outdated since the nuclear trinity of the United States was based around Air Force bombers, ICBMs, and nuclear submarines. But with the onset of the Korean War, it became clear that aircraft fighting it out with conventional guns and missiles would still be required. And if you lack friendly airbases to operate from, the alternative becomes the carrier combat aircraft. Here is in a nutshell and in not particular order a list of the best Cold War carrier combat aircraft. The Blackburn Buccaneer is a British attack aircraft. The Buccaneer specification was developed in reaction to the development of the Soviet Navy's Sverdlov cruisers. This required an aircraft capable of carrying a range of supplies, including nuclear bombs, anti-ship missiles, or up to 4,000 pounds of conventional bombs, at speeds of at least 550 knots at sea level, with a minimum radius of effect of 400 nautical miles at low altitude. While other aircraft employed high-pressure air from the engines blasted over the flaps to increase takeoff and landing performance, the Buccaneer took the concept to a new level. Lead air from the engines was ducked over the wings from immediately below the leading edge, flaps, and tailplane. This enhanced the coefficient of lift and angle of attack at stall, allowing for smaller wings and tailplanes. This resulted in a smoother ride at low altitudes, when a bigger tailplane would have rendered the aircraft too sensitive. The Buccaneer is also famous for being the first aircraft to use a head-up display, which provided steering signals to the weapon's release point as well as an indicator of the distance traveled and airspeed. During its relatively peaceful time in Royal Navy service, its major actions included assisting in the enforcement of the Barra Patrol in support of Rhodesia sanctions, bombing the stricken tanker Tory Canyon off land's end in an attempt to burn off the crude oil, and launching from Ark Royal in the middle of the Atlantic to conduct a show of force over Belize to deter a Guatemalan invasion. If you like this style of videos, you can support the channel by subscribing and leaving a like. Thank you. The Sea Fury, which arrived too late to see action in World War II, symbolizes the last generation of piston engine fighters, alongside the Bearcat and Sea Hornet. All three have relatively identical performance and weapons. The Sea Furies aboard the Royal Navy Carrier Thesis were the first to conduct patrols over the Korean Peninsula in 1950. In addition to their air-to-air -air capabilities, the Sea Fury could carry two 1,000-pound bombs or a collection of 60-pound rockets. The former quickly became the weapon of choice when it was discovered that the Fury's bubble canopy offered the pilot an edge in the dive-bombing role over the Firefly. Not only were they quite effective in providing close air support, they also directed naval gunfire. The Sea Hawk began as a private business by hawkers under the leadership of Sydney Cam. After an extensive development effort, the Sea Hawk emerged as a tapered wing jet with intakes and bifurcated exhaust located in the wing roots. Despite the Admiralty and the Air Ministry's lack of interest, hawkers built three prototypes, the first of which flew in September 1947. After successful carrier testing, the Royal Navy ordered 151 aircraft with the first frontline squadron formed in 1953. The Sea Hawk, perhaps one of the most beautiful aircraft ever to fly, was assigned to 13 frontline Royal Navy units. Seven of them were involved in the Suez Crisis in 1956, where they bombed, strafed, and provided close air support with little opposition. During one of them, their strafing was precise enough that the paratroopers they were assisting felt safe enough to advance while it was happening. Only two Sea Hawks were lost in the combat, with both pilots escaping, and a number of additional aircraft recovered despite serious damage. Other users of the Sea Hawk were the Indian Navy and the Royal Netherlands Navy. Another design that entered service too late for its intended conflict, the Douglas Sky Raider was a single-seat piston-engine aircraft planned as a dive-slash-torpedo bomber rather than a fighter. The Sky Raider, intended to replace the Avenger and Dauntless, first flew in March 1945, and by April, the U.S. Navy had ordered 548 aircraft. The Douglas design team placed an emphasis on weight reduction, which contributed to the success of the Sky Raider. In all, the design team saved 1,800 pounds, allowing the Sky Raider to carry 8,000 pounds of ordnance, including plans for one-way flights with a nuclear bomb. Due to its potential and inexpensive cost, orders for the Sky Raider were not reduced at the conclusion of World War II, and the first squadron was established in December 1946. 
With the invasion of South Korea, Sky Raiders were quickly deployed to execute ground attacks and mine-laying missions. The next year, Sky Raiders on board the carrier Princeton were tasked with attacking the Watchin Dam. Despite insufficient training in the use of torpedoes, the aircraft were modified to carry the weapons, including removing the air brakes. On May 1st, in what remains the final airborne torpedo strike on a surface target, eight Sky Raiders hit the dam, successfully destroying the control gates and preventing communist forces from managing water levels. Sky Raiders remained in service until 1968, when they were used in Vietnam for assault, close air support, and rescue missions. The only other naval user of the Sky Raider was the Royal Navy, who used it for airborne early warning. The Sky Raider is possibly unusual in that it has been evolved into single, two, three, and four-seat combat versions. Following the success of the Sky Raider, the Douglas design team developed a plan for its successor. The U.S. Navy requested an airplane weighing no more than 30,000 pounds to fulfill their range requirements for carrying a 2,000-pound nuclear bomb. Despite such limits, the Douglas design was half the weight while satisfying all of the criteria. The distinctive stocky undercarriage was a result of needing to accommodate room for the nuclear bomb. One of the weight-saving techniques was to limit the wingspan to 27 foot, which allowed them to fit down carrier lifts without folding, eliminated the need for hydraulic actuators, and allowed 2,000 liters of gasoline to be carried in each wing. The first operational squadron was formed in 1956, and two years later, the Skyhawk was in battle over Lebanon. This and future combat in Southeast Asia resulted in enhancements to the A-4's conventional armament capabilities, which were enlarged to carry a wide range of unguided and guided ordnance. At the same time, the maximum payload rose from 5,500 pounds in the A-4A to 9,195 pounds in the A-4M. The Skyhawk was a classic of the Cold War naval aviation, proving its capability in the skies above Vietnam and the Falkland Islands. Some believe the F-14 is the greatest naval fighter, and they may not be wrong. However, the aircraft was not without defects. The F-14A, which entered service in 1972, inherited the F-111's TF-30 engines. These were not ideal for a fighter since quick throttle motions, particularly drawing the throttle to idle, might cause the engine to stall. As shown in the movie Top Gun, the wide separation of the engines caused a flat spin as a result of the asymmetric thrust. Similar concerns arose while operating over 30,000 feet, forcing crews to operate at suboptimal altitudes, lowering range and endurance. All of these issues were resolved with the introduction of the F-110 engine in the F-14B. However, they did not enter service until 1987, for years before the Cold War ended. By that point, at least 24 Tomcats had been lost due to engine difficulties, accounting for about 28% of total losses. Despite this, the F-14A was able to cover the retreat from Saigon during its first voyage. They also covered the invasion of Grenada and intercepted an Egypt Air 737 carrying the hijackers of the MS Akil Laro, arriving alongside the plane at night as an EA-6B jammed radio connections. Navy F-14s also engaged two Libyan Su-22s in 1981 and again in the 1989 when they downed two Libyan MiG-23s. The intruder was designed to meet these specifications, a two-man crew, a radius of operation of 300 nautical miles for close air support and 1,000 nautical miles for long-range interdiction, and a speed of 500 knots. The first operational intruder squadron was constituted in November 1963. After preliminary tests revealed that the fuselage-mounted air brakes created considerable turbulence over the tailplane when deployed, they were relocated to the wingtips giving the aircraft a unique look in the approach position. In a unique attempt to generate lift, practically the whole trailing edge was employed as a flap, with roll control provided by spoilers on the top wing surface. By 1965, the intruders were at war in Vietnam, employing their sophisticated all-weather systems to hit North Vietnamese targets at night. Unfortunately, the systems were a little too sophisticated, and the aircraft initially had a 35% dependability rating. New radars and modifications to the Diane assault system provided improvements. At the same time, the U.S. Navy made an attempt to update all of its mapping of North Vietnam to ensure that the targets were where the intruder's systems believed they were. The A-6 received many revisions before maturing into the A-6E, which had a sensor turret holding an infrared camera and laser designator that were integrated with the avionics systems. Following Vietnam, the intruder participated in attacks against Lebanon, Libya, 
Iranian cargo during the tanker wars, and, as a swan song, helped liberate Kuwait in 1991. After over three decades of service, the A-6 was retired in favor of the F-A-18 Hornet. Despite being powered by a Pratt and Whitney J-57 engine similar to the F-100 Super Sabre, the Crusader could fly longer, faster, and higher while carrying more. To help bring the supersonic fighter on board, Vought utilized a variable incidence wing, which allowed the pilot to keep sight of the ship while flying slowly enough to land safely. These were subsequently upgraded to provide boundary layer control over the flaps, allowing the French Navy to land the Crusader on smaller carriers by lowering landing speed by 15 knots. During the Vietnam War, the Crusader had the best ratio of any U.S. aircraft, with 19 air-to-air -air wins and only three losses. It has been dubbed at last of the gunfighters because of its 420mm cannons, although it was improved throughout time to carry a greater range of weapons, allowing it to be employed for both ground attack and air defense operations. A new Magnavox radar with a wider dish was added to the F-8C, enabling it to use the AM-9C, the sole version of the Sidewinder that was radar-guided. The Crusader entered in service with the U.S. Navy in 1957 and remained active as a fighter for 20 years. The French Navy kept the F-8 in service for 35 years retiring them in 1999. Originally developed as an all-weather fleet defense interceptor, the Phantom appeared to be capable of practically any job, with a payload capacity of 16,000 pounds of bombs and missiles. The RF-4B also provided photo reconnaissance for the U.S. Marine Corps both afloat and onshore. It was one of the first carrier aircraft to have automated landing capabilities, which was tested on 12 modified F-4BS. They were equipped with a mechanism that allowed them to be controlled by surface ships. Using a retractable radar reflector in front of the nose gear, the aircraft carrier could utilize the technology to control the aircraft as it approaches the deck. However, for safety reasons, the F-4 pilots kept landing the aircraft themselves since the system was not 100% reliable. The Phantom, like the Intruder, had its combat debut in Vietnam, operating as a fighter and bomber. Unlike the Intruder, it would see service with the Royal Navy in a modified configuration, with J-79 turbojets replaced with Spey turbofans. Despite boosting the available power, the drag from the bigger intakes lowered the peak speed by around 0.2 Mach. They did, however, make the UK Phantoms the quickest, reaching at about 400 knots. The Phantom remained in frontline duty with the U.S. Navy until October 18, 1986, when it made its final carrier landing, almost precisely 25 years after the first frontline squadron became carrier certified. This was the height of the Cold War, and the F-4 demonstrated that carrier aircraft could compete with the finest in any air force, if only because besides the U.S. Navy and the British Royal Navy, 10 land-based air forces also bought the F-4. Thank you for watching. Leave a comment if you think I missed a Cold War carrier aircraft. If you want to learn more about aviation, follow the links on screen.